Good afternoon, uh, students. I, um, this afternoon, I just want to welcome you to this uh, online workshop. And uh, our topic today is pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenetics. And as you can see, the words, they are self-explanatory. Pharmacokinetics basically talks about the movement of drugs in the body. The pharmacogenetics is how the genetics influence the movement of drugs in the body. Okay. Um, firstly, in order to appreciate, you know, the, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenetics. Uh, it is important to just have an overview of pharmacology so that you know exactly the processes, the key processes that are involved in in in, uh, in pharmacology. Firstly, it's, it's important to know the drug formulations. We spoke about drug formulations in the first lecture. This is how drugs are formed. You can have uh, solid forms, liquid forms, and various um, variations. Also, it's important to know the drug administration. Basically, this is how drugs are introduced into the body. And in so doing, it's important to be, to know the, the dosage, drug dosages, and the route of administration. We remember we spoke about, you know, for example, oral route of administration, and then there are other routes, for example, via injection, via transdermal pads, etc. Having said that, it's also important to know the active drug release. Basically, once the drug has been administered, it needs to be released from its um, from its um, form or from its carrier, so that it's freely absorbed. After that, it's the drug absorption. Drug absorption is basically the movement of drug from the area of administration into the bloodstream. Also, it's important to know how drugs are distributed in the body. After the distribution, drugs, we need to, we need to know the drug effects. How effective is the drug administ administration? In so doing, it's also to be it's also important to be aware of the drug reactions. You can have positive drug effects and negative drug effects. After drug effects, it's important to know the drug metabolism. So we'll speak about this in details. Once the drug has been metabolized, it's important also to know how the drug is eliminated from the body hence drug elimination let's first first start with the first processes basically is first process is, the, is our topic today it's the pharmacokinetics so pharmacokinetics basically is 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 a pharmacology basically that concerns the movement of drugs within the body Pharmacology is the study of drug movements within the body. So it talks about how the body handles these drugs once they enter the body. And the processes, the physiological processes that are involved in these drug movements. And basically there are four processes. The first one is drug absorption. The second is drug distribution. The third is drug metabolism. The final one is the drug elimination. Let's look at the first process. Drug absorption. As I said earlier, that drugs once administered into the body through whichever you know, route, the, the drugs have to be absorbed. What does this mean? This is the entrance of the drug into the bloodstream from the site of administration. Very important to note that it's the entrance of the drug into the bloodstream. 
if you do not mention about bloodstream, that answer is wrong. So it's important to understand that absorption is the movement of drugs from the site of administration into the bloodstream. Okay, this diagram basically shows the movement of drugs through absorption between body compartments. For example, the GI, gastrointestinal tract, is an example of site of administration. The drug basically will move from the GI into the blood. As you can see, the arrow show, showing, you know, indicating the direction into the blood. And from the blood, the drug may also move from the blood into the kidneys and vice versa. So, having said that, still talking about drug absorption, this also makes us to be aware that how much of the drug, for example, of the original dose that is taken by the individual and how much of it actually reaches the circulation. A very important um, parameter that determines how much of the original dose reaches the blood circulation is called bioavailability. So bioavailability is the amount of drugs from the original dose which makes it into the circulation. And having said that, the bioavailability of drugs vary based on the type uh, route of administration. For example, after intravenous injection, the bioavailability is 100%. Why? Because with IV injection, the drug is injected directly into the bloodstream. As opposed, for example, to gas gastrointestinal absorption. Absorption via the GI will vary between 0 to 100 percent. We'll talk more about this later. Now let us discuss the, the factors that may determine um, drug absorption. These are the factors that may influence drug absorption. The first one is the size. When we talk about size, basically we are talking about the size of the drug molecules involved. Some drug molecules are small, others are large. So we all know that cell membranes are lipid bilayer, which means small molecules cross cell membranes more easily than large molecules. The second factor is drug solubility. There are two types of drug solubility. The first one is fat soluble and the second is water soluble, meaning there are drugs which are only soluble in fats, others are soluble in water. How does this influence drug absorption? Fat-soluble drugs, they pass through the lipid membrane with ease. As you know that lipid membranes are bilayer, lipid bilayer. So, they traverse through the cell membrane way much easily. As for water-soluble drugs, these drugs may form as they dissolve, they may form charged ions. And based on the charged ions, how much of the charged ions is influenced by the pH of the compartment. For example, if you take a drug which is water-soluble through the oral route, goes into the stomach. And as you know, the stomach is an acidic environment that 
may influence the, the, the pH of the drug and eventually the solubility of that drug. High proportion of charged uh, drug molecules may render poor solubility. I will, I will speak about that. Let's look at how this, this works out, you know, in what we call ion trapping. Basically, in ion trapping, the pH of the environment, as we know, influences drug solubility. So, drugs that are weak acids are usually unionized in the acidic environment, which means they are not ionized. As a result, they are absorbed, they are easily absorbed into the bloodstream. The bloodstream pH is alkaline. In the alkaline environment, drug molecules are easily ionized. Once they are ionized, they show poor lipid solubility. As such, they cannot diffuse back to the compartment from which it came and then become trapped within the bloodstream. This is called ion trapping. Okay. Now, let's look at other factors that determine drug absorption. First one is blood flow. The rate at which the blood flows will influence drug absorption. For example, poor blood flow may result in lower absorption. And how does that work out? A person who is, for example, walking or exercising will have their blood flow at high rate. Eventually, will influence drug absorption at higher rate. The second is drug formulation. The type of drug formulation will influence drug absorption. We earlier spoke about the solid drug formulations and the liquid drug formulation. It is known that liquid drugs are easily absorbed via the GI than solid drugs. And also gut factors. Here when we speak about gut factors, basically we are talking about the GI. The first factor is the enzymes. As you know that within the GI, there are various types of enzymes which mm, digest the foods. It depends on the presence or absence of these specific enzymes. Also, the amount of these enzymes will vary. If you have ex ex excess amount of the enzyme, it will influence the rate of drug absorption. And the second GI factor is GI motility. When we talk about GI motility, we're talking about the natural movement of the GI muscles. As the food is ingested, as the drugs are ingested, whatever goes into the GI, they are natural movements which are facilitated by the nervous system and the muscles. In some individuals, there are certain compartments within the GI that may not be efficiently, uh, may not have efficient movement of the muscles. And this may hinder the rate at which drugs are absorbed. The next factor is the gastric emptying rate. The rate at which the, the gastric uh, or the emptying of the, the for example, the, the stomach will determine the rate of drug absorption. The next is presence or absence of food in the GI. You know, if with the presence of food in the GI, there is a dilution factor of the drug. 
So the more food you have, the more diluted it is. Hence, the slower the drug absorption because the drug will have to maneuver around the food to find itself into the walls or the gut and get absorbed. So this next diagram basically shows the types of factors that influence drug absorption based on the, G, the, the site of the GI. For example, in the stomach, the rate of gastric emptying, the GI motility, presence of the food digestive and digestive enzymes will influence drug absorption in the stomach. And also, blood supply at the stomach level will also influence drug absorption. We also have absorptive surface. This is the surface of the stomach, and the condition of the surface will also influence drug absorption. Going further down, uh, you have around uh, in the intestines the drug molecule size and solubility plays a big role in the drug absorption. Also, the active drug transport system may influence the drug absorption rate. Okay. Having said that, let's look at the drug distribution mechanism. Basically, drug distribution mechanism talks about how drugs are transported from as soon as they enter the bloodstream and how they are transported to the various parts of the body where the drug goes after absorption and how it gets there generally once drugs are into the bloodstream they are received by all most of the tissues and most of the cells but only a few of these tissues may be actually affected by the drug. So, how does this um, how does this operate? Basically, it depends on whether the biological system with which the drug interacts with is present in that tissue or not. When I talk about the biological system, is basically the receptors for that drug. Drugs are designed in a manner that they can only bind to certain specific receptors of specific tissues where the drug is intended to produce an effect or reaction reaction. Yeah. So while talking about distribution, how much the drug gets to the site of action and how quickly the drug gets to the site of action is determined by the blood flow. If the flow of blood is slow, the drug will get to the site of action in a slow manner. It will take more time than when the blood is quick. Having said that, it's also important to note that while the blood, while the drug enters the blood, there are certain areas within the body which hold drugs, drug molecules. These are called drug reservoirs. Drug reservoirs, they bind drug molecules and hold them for a while. For example, body fat tissues, they reserve or they bind, they, they hold uh, drug, they hold fat soluble drugs within their tissue and make them unavailable. The blood plasma also bind drug molecules. We'll talk more about that later. It's also important to note that they are what we call natural drug barriers. 
these natural drug barriers will influence the distribution of drug molecules throughout the body. For example, the brain, the placenta, and the testes. These have got barriers. Barriers basically will hinder the flow of blood uh, of drug molecules, of certain drug molecules into these organs for safety purposes. As you know, the brain is a very sensitive organ. So nature has designed such that these barriers will only allow certain drug drug molecules to pass through, while the rest will be held back. Same as placenta. As you know, the placenta holds the fetus. The testes also, they hold sperms. So you know the importance of natural drug barriers. If let's let's look at this diagram which depicts the protein uh, bound drug in the reservoir. Basically, the blood protein, or let's say the blood plasma protein, acts as a reservoir in the sense that it binds drug molecules. And once molecules are bound to these proteins, they are not available for action. In this diagram, we have the blood vessel showing the arrow. Within the vessel, you can see the two types of, you know, structures. You have the big uh, oval structure representing the blood plasma molecule, and each one binding two drug molecules, while other molecules are freely moving in the body. The proportion of bound drug molecules is in equilibrium with the free molecules. And at this state, the drug is 40% protein bound, which means 60% is free. Okay, let's move on to the next um, process, which is the drug metabolism. The drug metabolism basically is a mechanism which transforms drugs, changing the forms of, of drug for various purposes. This is a physiological process which acts to change the structure of the drug to render them, you know, for example, to render them um, readily available for excretion. And this is done by enzyme action. As you know that the liver is the main, the liver and the kidneys are the main sites of drug metabolism. So within this organ, there are enzymes that react to the drug molecules and change their forms so that they are easily excreted. And in so doing, they avoid drug accumulation within the body. Here is a diagram that shows drug metabolism. Um, as, for example, from the top, you can see the stomach pH is 0.3. At this type, at this environment, is a weak acid environment, and most of the the drug, drug molecules are unionized. They are relatively lipophilic. As such, they, they are absorbed into the bloodstream. Where they are ionized because of the high pH or alkaline pH. And once they are ionized, they can actually move into the liver where they are converted to a weak base and once they are converted to a weak base they move out into the bloodstream again and they can move to the kidney filter it and they are ready for elimination or at, at the bottom drug excretion okay so still on drug metabolism drugs are absorbed from most of the GI tract, and these 
once they are absorbed from the GI, usually they have to pass through the what they call hepatic portal vein into the liver before they enter the circulation. It's very important to note this. Once drugs are absorbed through the GI, they go via the hepatic portal vein into the liver before they enter into the systemic circulation. And once they are in the liver, this is where the drug metabolism takes place. As such, drugs may be subject to some metabolism before they get to the site of action. And this actually may lead to reducing the amount of drugs that gets to the site of action. Also, it means that you may actually require higher oral dose to make that drug effective. So these are two important key um, elements that you need to know as a result of drug metabolism via the liver. This is what is called first pass effect. First part, pass effect will reduce the amount of drugs that leave the liver into the systemic circulation. As such, this will lessen the amount of drugs that gets to the site of action. And in so doing, you may require to give higher dose, oral dose, for the drug to be effective. Okay, this diagram basically is, uh, explains the hepatic first pass effect. As you can see on the left part of the drug, 100 milligram of the drug is administered via the oral route and once it reaches the intestine 90 percent of or rather 90 milligram of the drug is actually absorbed into the drug oh, sorry into the into the bloodstream into the bloodstream once it reaches the liver which means 90 percent of the 90, 90 milligram of the drug reaches the liver and is involved in metabolism. After the metabolism, only 10 milligram of the drug will actually come out of the liver and enter the systemic circulation, which means only 10 milligram is available for drug action. Okay, having said that, let's look at the next process. After drug metabolism, the next process is excretion. This is a process where the body actually eliminates the drugs and gets rid of you know, all the unnecessary drugs from the body. And the primary, uh, primary, you know, roots of excretion are via the kidneys in the urine or via the bile in feces. However, it's important to note that there are other roots which include lungs. For example, when you're breathing out through the lungs, some of the drugs, they live as vapor, in form of vapor or gas and also through sweat glands as sweat. Also, it's important to note that there are certain drugs that do not necessarily mean to be metabolized. These are drugs that are not metabolized and they are eliminated, are unchanged, such as penicillins. Okay, this diagram basically depicts uh, the drug excretion processes, the various organs, and how it is done. Okay, let's now look at the important factors that influence pharmacokinetics. The first factor is age. So, age will influence the rate at which drugs are moved, you know, from from absorption to excretion. How does this influence the, the pharmacokinetics? In very young and elderly uh, individuals, 
this is an important factor because organs in the young ones are not fully developed. Whereas in the elderly people, these organs are weak. They cannot perform their functions efficiently. As such, they will actually affect the rate of um, drug movement in the processes that we spoke about earlier. The next factor is the genetic makeup of the individual. As you know that individuals have different genetic makeups. And because of this, there will be variability in enzyme levels, which may lead to different rates of metabolism. Okay? So, if we, now we, we, that leads us to pharmacogenetics. Basically, as we, as we have seen, proteins are an important component in drug mechanism of action. So, proteins are derived, for example, enzymes are proteins. And these proteins are derived from the genetic mechanisms of the individuals. So, there may be, as a result of genetic variations across the population, the makeup of these proteins may lead to different forms of a given enzymes, for example. Within a given population, you may get different forms of a given enzyme. This is called genetic polymorphism. Okay. Still on pharmacogenetics, as we said, genetic traits such as enzymes, they are expressed in the population at least for two different forms of phenotypes. For example, alcohol dehydrogenase is an enzyme that degrades alcohol. It neutralizes alcohol once it's taken into the body. But the levels of alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme it varies between female and male. It is known that women or female have low levels of alcohol dehydrogenase. And this is why generally women, they get drunk quickly. They get drunk more quickly than men once they take alcohol. In the same way, there are other enzymes which are important for drug, uh, drug, which are important for pharmacology. And these may, may come in different forms. Some individuals, for example, they have excess amount of enzyme. Others have sometimes completely lack of those specific enzymes. And those may influence the rate of pharmacokinetics. Now, the, the point is, if an enzyme involved in drug metabolism provides different degrees of responsiveness, you may actually get, within a given population, individuals that are called responders and some individuals which are called non-responders for a given drug metabolism. And in so doing, you may get some individuals which experience ineffective drug treatment and may lead to toxic treatment. And also within a given population, you may get what is called bimodal distribution of response at population level. I'll explain this in the next, uh, in the next chart. For example, this chart shows a normal distribution of drug responsiveness 
at the population level, which is the normal population. Mm -hmm. You can see on the x-axis, you have the measured drug response, which peaks at 40%. And then on the y-axis, you have got response frequency. However, when you have a bimodal drug responsiveness at the population level, which means there are some individuals which are called non-responders, which will have low drug response, forming their own peak, which is the peak number one, at 20%. And then you have another group, which are called responders, peaking at high drug response, which peaks at 60%. So this is what we call uh, drug polymorphism. Drug polymorphism. Now, how does this influence, you know, the the genetic, you know, the drug drug um, kinetics? The consequences of these non-responders and the responders are as follows. You can see in the diagram on the non-responders, the blood drug concentrations usually are extremely high. They are above the maximum self-concentration because the body does not respond to the administered drug and the drugs keep accumulating. They are not excreted because there are no enzymes to process them. And this will lead to drug toxicity. You can see in the second bar where you have responders. With the responders, basically, the levels of blood concentration, drug blood concentration, will not reach the minimum effective concentration. And so, it will always be below the, that level. Hence, uh, their, their safety. So basically, this is the consequence of genetic polymorphism. And that brings us to the end of the lecture. And because we, this is an online lecture, if you have any questions, please feel free to send these questions via email. And uh, I'll be able to answer them. And then also just be mindful, I'll be sending um, a, a tutorial activities. I'll send some information regarding the tutorial activities for this lecture. And these will be sent for you to complete at home. Please, I remind you, all of you, please participate in these homework activities. They are very important because they contribute to your final mark okay thank you very much for your attention goodbye